Good evening and welcome to UT Southwestern Science Cafe. We welcome both our regulars and our new guests to this ongoing series. My name is Jenny King and on behalf of my colleagues in public affairs, as well as our distinguished faculty members and our special guest speaker, thank you for joining us. Tonight, we are pleased to present a special episode about colon cancer. Before I turn over the virtual podium to Dr. Amy Lowe, our guest moderator, let me share a little more about, you, about Science Cafe. Science Cafes are online conversations where faculty and guest speakers take you on deep dives into science and health topics. As an academic medical center, UT Southwestern brings together research, medical and health education, and patient care into one institution. Our research and education inform care advancements quickly, which is a benefit to patients here and beyond. Science Cafe allows us to highlight this important work and bring it into the community. We do have fun with Science Cafe as well we learn, and today's program will be no exception. Our format is casual and interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions and engage with us during the program. This evening, we will be discussing colon cancer, prevention, treatments, and one survivor's story. Before we begin, let me share a few technical points. We are recording this program and we're also live streaming it on our UT Southwestern Twitter page. We ask you to please mute your microphones during the presentation to help with audio clarity for everyone. Also, we encourage you to leave your video on so we can see our Science Cafe community, especially during the Q&A portion of our program. And finally, just a reminder, while we cannot personal medical questions, we would love to hear from you with general questions on the topic of colon cancer prevention, screening, research, and care. And with that, I am so pleased to introduce our faculty members, starting with our guest moderator, Dr. Amy Lowe. Dr. Lowe is assistant professor in the Department of Internal Medicine here at UT Southwestern. Her clinical interests include quality metrics and endoscopy, cancer screening, and general gastroenterology. Dr. Lowe is new to North Texas as she recently moved here from Boston after working in internal medicine there for 15 years, post-residency and clinical fellowship. Welcome, Dr. Lowe. After Dr. Lowe, we will hear from Dr. Cecilia Brewington, Chief of Community Radiology and Professor and Vice Chair of Clinical Operations in the Department of Radiology at UT Southwestern. Dr. Brewington is an advocate for the prevention and increased awareness of colon health for all people particularly in underrepresented communities. And later, we will hear from Dr. Syed Ali Kazmi, Assistant Professor of Internal Medicine. He focuses on gastrointestinal malignancies and specializes in colon cancer research at UT Southwestern Simmons Cancer Center. He is interested in all aspects of clinical research, including patient-centered outcome research, quality assessment, and designing interventions to improve delivery of cancer care to underserved populations. We are pleased to have another special guest joining us today, Sint Marshall, CEO of the Dallas Mavericks. Dr. Lowe will introduce her after Dr. Brewington, Brewington's presentation. To Drs. Lowe, Brewington, and Cosme, and to Sint, thank you all for joining us this evening and welcome to Science Cafe. Dr. Lowe, the virtual podium is yours. Thank you, Jenny. I'm so pleased to be part of Science Cafe tonight discussing the topic of colon cancer prevention. This is my main career focus and I'm quite passionate about it. I'd like to start by sharing a broad overview of what I do in the field of gastroenterology. I wanna bring a greater awareness and understanding for patients on, about how doctors in my field help them prevent colon cancer from happening. And before I get started, I'm pleased to share that UT Southwestern's patient navigators who are, trained in the field of, who are trained in the gastroenterology field are on standby this evening, keeping our phone lines open until 9 p.m. to take your call should you want to schedule yourself for a prevention screening tonight. Their number, and we'll see it later, is 214-645-8355. And we encourage you to call tonight after the program or call tomorrow or in the coming days. The common thread for all of us speaking tonight is prevention. As I said before, I'm a clinical gastroenterologist, and this means that I see patients with issues that involve the esophagus, stomach, small intestine, colon, from top to bottom. And patients can see me for a variety of issues, including acid reflux, diarrhea, belly pain. They can see me or any of my colleagues. But my clear focus is endoscopy and colon cancer screening, and that's what we're talking about tonight. And let me just share my screen one second.
So if you hear nothing else tonight, please remember this. Colon cancer is one of the most common cancers in the whole world, affecting millions of people. And over 50,000 people die from colon cancer every year. What's special about colon cancer as opposed to other cancers is that it's preventable. Meaning that if our message is heard tonight and other times, we could pre potentially prevent hundreds of thousands of diagnoses of cancer and several thousand deaths. And so that's really what I want you to remember that if you look for it early, we can prevent colon cancer. There are lots of different ways to, uh, to screen for colon cancer. Um, there are simple tests that, that can range from testing a bowel movement for blood or abnormal DNA. These tests are really simple. They can be done at home, but then they can become more complex. Or for example, we could, another way of screening is a CT colonography, which my colleague, Dr. Bruentin will discuss later. We can also do sigmoidoscopies and colonoscopies. A sigmoidoscopy is a partial colonoscopy. Oops, sorry. So what's a colonoscopy? Basically, it's a procedure where we use a flexible tube with a camera to examine the entirety of the colon. It involves taking a series of liquid solutions that basically cause you to have diarrhea multiple times. It, contain, it cleans out the colon so that we can see the mucosa underneath and remove polyps when we see them. And so you can see here on the right side, a picture of the colonoscopy. Um, the pros of the uh, colonoscopy is that we're able to remove polyps at the time of visualization before they can grow and become cancerous. Um, and uh, you know, as far as the other evaluations, the fecal tests, the uh, cologuard, the CT colonography, if you have an abnormal test, it requires a colonoscopy. The cons are, as one can imagine, you have to prep for the colonoscopy. It does take time. Uh, and then with, if you require sedation, which most colonoscopies are done this way, you need a responsible ride home. But afterwards, if you're lucky, you have loved ones who are really spoiling you for the rest of the day. Um, and this is why I think it's very important um, to think about doing colonoscopies early. If you, you can see that, that polyps are, polyp to colon cancer, they all start at, out as polyps and they start small, they grow up over time and eventually they can grow into colon cancer. And so our goal is to find them when they're small and take them out. Uh, and this is where the big blue arrow is, is where uh, we wanna see them. We can find them when they're small and remove them before they become problematic. So what are the myths regarding colonoscopy? Number one, I don't have time for a colonoscopy. And as I explained before, it only takes 30 to 45 minutes. So it's very short. There is uh, some time pre-evaluation, there's time after the uh, evaluation before you can go home. Myth number two, I feel fine, I don't need a colonoscopy. And we have to remember that most polyps and even some colon cancers are actually asymptomatic. Um, eventually colon cancers can become symptomatic and they, they can present as abdominal pain, bloody stools, constipation, changes in the way your stool looks. Uh, but far away, most polyps and some colon cancers are completely without symptoms. Myth number three, I'm scared. If I have a polyp, does that mean I have colon cancer? The vast majority of polyps are actually completely benign. Um, a portion of them, of them can eventually grow and they can turn into colon cancer. So again, it's really best to take them out when they're small. A colonoscopy is too painful. That's myth number four. As we talked about before, our sedation is, uh, is the norm during colonoscopy. It's like a very relaxing nap. It's a, generally a quick on, quick off medication. Is it possible to do a colonoscopy without, a, without sedation? The answer is yes. Um, it generally feels like some significant bloating and cramping. But the good thing about doing a colonoscopy without sedation, if you're, if you're open to it, is that you have the rest of the day for yourself. Myth number five, I won't be able to tolerate the preparation. It's true that preparations in the past have been primarily the big jug, go lightly, which is a gallon of medication. But over time, things have become a little bit easier. There's, there, there are many different options, including some with pills and also many much smaller volumes. Myth number six, this is two part. Aren't I too young? We start screening at age 45. Um, and the reason why is we have found that even though the frequency of colon cancer diagnoses 
and, uh, and death from colon, from colon cancer has decreased, the age of colon cancer diagnoses is actually starting to become younger. And so that's why we start a little earlier. And we especially start earlier in, in those who have family history of colon cancer, POPs, or other underlying diseases like ulcer colitis or Crohn's disease. Uh, and lastly, I'm healthy, I can't have polyps. Again, most polyps are asymptomatic. We can find polyps in as, as, as little as 25% of patients, but sometimes we can find them up to 50 to 60% of patients. And this is just open access, like first time colonoscopies for screening purposes, we can find polyps very frequently. And then briefly, colonoscopy at UT Southwestern. Um, when, you, when you find uh, that you're ready for a colonoscopy, um, you can obviously get it done anywhere, but at, uh, at UT Southwestern, I feel like it's a special place. So when you're finding a colonoscopist, you wanna make sure that they're finding polyps in their, uh, during their colonoscopy. Average is 25% of the time, but at UT Southwestern, our average is up to 41%. Um, you also wanna make sure that your colonoscopist is reaching the entirety of the colon, that they're reaching the cecum. Nationally, the average is 20 is 90%, but, but here at UT Southwestern, it's over 99%. And lastly, you wanna make sure that your, your gastroenterologist is inspecting the walls of the colon for polyps, a minimum of six minutes on withdrawal. And again, at UT Southwestern, we have withdrawal times of at least six minutes. Men, many have significantly greater. Uh, and then finally, we have four endoscopy sites available, including Clemens Hospital, the Outpatient Surgical Center. These are both downtown. Um, also UT Southwestern Frisco, and then Texas Presbyterian on Walnut Hill. So this is the number, again, UT Southwestern patient navigators are, are reachable today at 214-645-8355 until 9 p.m. today, and then every day, Monday through Friday. Let me just stop sharing. All right. So now I'm pleased to turn over the virtual podium to my colleague, Dr. Cecilia Brewington, who shares my passion for prevention messaging. Dr. Brewington? All right. Well, thank you again, Dr. Lowe, for turning over the baton. And good night to all of you for uh, attending today um, or tonight so we can talk about colorectal cancer prevention and early detection. Uh, this is a very important topic. So some of the things I'm going to talk about are going to be uh, repeats from what Dr. Lowe has covered, but they're so important. I think it's important for you to hear it again uh, so we can talk about it. So next slide, please. All right, so just a few facts that are important. First of all, colorectal cancer is the third most common cancer in Americans in both men and women, yet it's the second leading cause of cancer death in men and women. And that's a shame because it is largely preventable. Just as my colleague, Dr. Lowe mentioned, we can prevent colorectal cancer in most of, the most of the cases because we know how it originates. It starts from those little polyps that she was talking about. And in 2022, we expect to see new cases to the tune of 151,000 new cases in 2022. Some of this is due to the fact that we saw a decrease in screening because of COVID, but we know how to do this. And at UT Southwestern, we've been able to safely bring patients in, whether we are in a pandemic or not, and continue this very important screening that has to occur. Over 52,000 are expected to die this year, again, for a cancer that is largely preventable. And we prevent this by removing those precursor lesions, those polyps. Next slide. All right, to the right, um, we, we see another image where we can see how that small little bump, if you look at that pink image, uh, starts to grow and grow and grow over time. And uh, just as my colleague mentioned, it takes, a it takes quite a bit of time. So 10 to 15 and sometimes, depending on the cancer type, 20 years out before it develops into a cancer. So that means we have a huge window of opportunity to catch this before it turns into a cancer. And we do that by screening. So most cancers, again, that arise in the colon are going to originate in this way. Next slide. Now, we talked about detecting them 
and getting rid of those polyps to prevent the cancer. But there is also great news that my colleague, Dr. Kazami is going to talk about later are the treatments if we find an early cancer. So on the table that you see in front of us, if we find an early cancer when the disease is still localized, localized to the mucosa, the five-year survival rate is 91%. We know this by studying the evidence. And so that tells us that we shouldn't think that, oh, well, I don't want to go to the doctor because I might have cancer and I just don't want to know about it. That's absolutely the wrong attitude to take. Because of today's discoveries in medicine, we know that we can take care of cancers if we detect them early and the survival rates are great. So this is the survival rate for colon cancer if it's localized, 91%. If it's regional, meaning it's a little further spread than being localized, 72% at five years. Next slide. For rectal cancer, that changes a bit, but still, if the disease is caught early, we can have an 89% survival rate at five years. And beyond that, your chances are great as well because we've improved our medical therapies, our surgeries, our treatments. So again, it's not a death sentence to have a cancer. What we wanna see people do is screen to prevent the cancers, but if we find it, we have great treatment options. Next slide. So what can we do? We wanna put the power back in your hands because all of us have to take a personal responsibility for our health care. So what can we do to prevent colorectal cancer? Next slide. We can be more aware of our risk factors. So uh, what can we do? We can look at our diet. Diet can facilitate decreasing our overall risk for colorectal cancer. Diets higher in fiber. We talk about whole wheats, uh, whole grain cereals. Those are things that are healthier for our colon. Staying away from fried foods, of course. Doing things in moderation. Decreasing our alcohol consumption. Exercising. These are the things, of course, I know most of you hear this when you go see your doctor. We always say the same thing. We want you to exercise. We want you to eat correctly. Well, there is a real benefit to this because it decreases our overall risk for developing all cancers, but also specifically tonight we're talking about that decreasing the risk for colorectal cancer. Then we can also be more aware of our family histories. And you know, for some of us that might be more difficult, but if you can get to your family members and start having these conversations, you know, this is something we have to do more of. We have to know whether or not our first degree relatives had a history of colorectal cancer or a history of polyps. We should know whether or not we have a tendency for multiple members in our family to have polyps because there are syndromes that are associated with increased risk for developing colorectal cancer. So a few of them are listed on the slide. A family history of adenomatous polyps, familial polyposis syndrome, and then a big one, Lynch syndrome, that has associated higher risk for colorectal cancer and some additional cancers. But again, no, trying to know our family history is very important to help us prevent colorectal cancer and to do a better job of taking care of one another within our families and within our friends. So increase our awareness. Then as my colleague, Dr. Lowe mentioned, be aware of the symptoms that might suggest there's something wrong. Is the caliber of your stool or the size of your stool changing all of a sudden? Uh, is it starting to be pencil thin is what we say. Do you have any bleeding uh, in your stool? Now these topics are not things that we like to talk about, um, even with our family members but it's important because it can save lives. So let's look at what's happening to our bodies. Let's look at how our, our stool habits might be changing. Constipation when you've not been constipated before is an important finding. Diarrhea when you've not had diarrhea or loose stools in the past is an important finding. Next slide. And then last but not least, the other thing we can do to prevent colorectal cancer is to screen. 
Now we've talked about optical colonoscopy or the, uh, the use of that scope to do the uh, test to look and identify polyps. But there are really two different buckets of screening tests. So let me go into that a little more in detail. There are what we call the stool-based test. Uh, and we might have, you may be aware of this, where we test actual stool. We, we look at the stool by putting it on um, a, uh, a, a piece of paper or a cardboard um, or in a tube, and we test for the presence of blood. So that's one way to test to see if there is a cancer that might be bleeding. Then there are other stool-based tests that actually test for DNA evidence of presence of a cancer. Then we have a different selection of tests, which we call the direct visualization test. And just as the name implies, direct visualization, these are tests that we can do where we actually see whether you have a cancer or the precursor of a cancer, that polyp again that we talked about. And those tests are the optical colonoscopy that my colleague discussed and also a test that may be a little less well-known called a CT colonography exam or virtual colonoscopy. And as the name implies, we create virtual images so we can see inside the colon. Next slide. So we talked about the colonoscopy, so I'm not gonna go back over that. But one other good feature about having a colonoscopy, after you do it, if you get a clean bill of health, you don't have to repeat that test for 10 years. So every 10 years is not too bad for something that a lot of us are not going to have a positive result from. And so we just keep doing it every 10 years, get that clean bill of health. And as Dr. Lowe mentioned, you go home and you sleep the rest of that anesthesia off, okay? All right, next slide. Now let's talk about CT colonography. On the image on your right that has the black background, that's what we see when we do a colonoscopy using that scope and looking through your colon. On the left is a recreation of the inner linings of your colon created from a CAT scan or CT scan. And many of you have already had CT scans, so you know that's a painless exam. Well, we can create images from those CT scans and create images that look very similar to how our GI colleagues are looking at the inner side of your colon. And these do a great job at identifying, once again, those small little polyps by taking pictures. Next slide. So how do we create those images? Now, I would like to tell you that you don't have to take the prep uh, that, that causes you to you know, have um, uh, loose stools for the next couple of hours after you start to drink the prep, but we still need to clean the colon just as we do with an optical colonoscopy because the cleaner your colon, the better our test is going to be. And we're very good at detecting polyps. If we do a great job at, at cleaning your colon before we take those pictures, our sensitivity for detecting those little tiny polyps are going, is going to be to the tune of about 94% in accuracy in finding those polyps. Next slide. The other benefit is that when you do a CT colonography, you don't need a driver to take you home because there is no anesthesia involved. You, clean, you take the prep beforehand, you come in and you get the test, and then you can go home and resume your normal activities. So what's the prep like? Well, two days out from the prep, we like to see you start a low residue diet, meaning we don't want you eating raw vegetables or fried foods. It's a good time to have a low residue diet that has well-cooked vegetables, baked chicken, beef, fish, nothing that's high in, in fiber like raw vegetables. Then the day before, we like to see you start what we call a clear liquid diet. So that might be your chicken noodle soup, without much of the chicken, Sprite, Powerade. You can still have that cup of coffee. You'll be happy to know for the coffee drinkers out there or a clear soup of some sort. We want you to avoid the milk, the orange juice and tomato juice. So that's not too bad for the day before. Next slide. 
Now the actual prep again involves cleansing the colon just as we did for the optical colonoscopy or the standard colonoscopy. So we do have you drink a substance that helps to finish cleaning out the colon. And then there's another substance in the white bottle labeled Tagatol to the left that we have you drink. And what that does is as the name implies, it tags any stool that remains within the colon. And that helps us be very specific to separate what's residual colon in the, in the bowel, I'm sorry, residual stool in the bowel versus some uh, little tiny polyp. And again, we can detect things that are a few millimeters in size. Next slide. So I'm just telling you a little bit more about the test. On that pink image down at the bottom, is the small little tube that we have to place into the rectum when you come in for an optical colonoscopy. We need to put a small tube within the rectum just about a centimeter, two centimeters in, and we inflate that little balloon that you see. And that's to help us keep the air in your colon that we need to inflate your colon with. And we use that device over to the left, it's called a CO2 or carbon dioxide inflator and we inflate your colon with a small amount of air. And that's just distending your colon so that we can see inside when we take those pictures. That little tube is probably about the size of a pen. All right, you can see how thin that is. Now, I know that sounds like it's uncomfortable, but I can tell you that I don't get complaints about this tube from the patients that have had this. They're happy to not have to be put to sleep. They're happy that this test is gonna take 20 minutes and then they're off and on their way back to work or back to whatever activity that they're going to do. Next slide. So let's take a look at those CT scans. First you come in, we put that little tube into the rectum and you lie on your back on the CT table and we take some pictures and it looks similar to the one that you see below the image. Then we have you turn over, next slide, and click that slide. So you flip over and you lie on your stomach and we take some more pictures. Next slide. Now, how long does all that take? Now I'm talking to you right now and I can tell you that our CT scanners have gotten better and better and better. And in the time that I'm talking to you, that's the time that it will take for this CT scanner to take the pictures of your entire colon. And when it's finished, then we have you get up off the table. So let's see that again. To the left, you saw the fastest scanner we have. In the middle, you saw a slightly slower scanner. And I can tell you that at, CT, at UT Southwestern, we don't have any more of the scanners on your right that say 16 slides that are still going. So it's just that fast that we can take those pictures and screen your colon to help save your life. Next slide. So what is the best test that you can do to screen for colorectal cancer? Well, I'm gonna tell you what the American Cancer Society tells us. The best test that you can do is the one that you will do. So we've talked about the standard colonoscopy where you're put to sleep, you sleep during the entire test and you go home and you can sleep for the rest of the day or a couple of hours feeling rested. Or you can get a virtual colonoscopy where you come in for a CT scan and you lie on a table, we take some pictures and you can go back to your regular activities. You don't need an additional driver and that's it. Now you do come back every five years as opposed to every 10 years. And then there are the stool-based tests that you could take and you can do that at home. Now they're not as sensitive at finding polyps, but they do do a great job of finding early cancer that my colleague's going to talk about how we can treat and you can have a great life if we can detect those cancers early. So the best test is the one that we can get you to do because screening has to be done at every interval that we recommend for it to be effective. And we just need to get people to screen. Next slide. So thank you.
for coming tonight so that we can take steps to help you save a life. It might be your own, it might be a family member or a friend, but let's share this information. And I'll turn it back over to Dr. Love. Thank you, Dr. Barrington, for your very informative presentation. I'm sure our audience feels like I do, that you're inspiring with your, inspiring with your work and avid focus on the power of prevention. Now, I'm pleased to introduce our special guest. Sint Marshall is a CEO of the Dallas Mavericks. She is the first Black female CEO in the NBA, and she's a dynamic force for inclusion and diversity within the Mavericks organization, the NBA, and here throughout North Texas. In addition to her multitude of accomplishments, Sint is also a colon cancer survivor. We're grateful to have her joining us tonight to share her story. Sint, thank you and the Mavs for collaborating with us on this event. Thank you, Dr. Lowe, and thank, I wanna thank everyone for allowing me to be a part of this uh, great uh, science cafe and to tell my uh, story. Uh, my cancer journey uh, started with a phone call the day before New Year's Eve, 2020. I remember getting a call from um, my surgeon. He says, I have news, I hope you're sitting down. I have news, it's bad and it's significant. Uh, you have cancer in your lymph nodes and your blood vessels. Uh, this is when my out of body experience actually started uh, because I was certain that he was not talking to me. Uh, how could I have, have cancer when I was healthy, when I was active, I didn't drink alcohol. In fact, the only reason I had a colonoscopy is because I was in uh, a session at work. I worked for at t at the time and we were in a corporate athlete session where they asked us to focus on our physical, mental, and spiritual health. They gave us uh, emotional health. They gave us all these uh, assessments and my score wasn't the greatest on the physical aspect of it. Uh, now I had recently kind of changed my diet, kind of put my fried chicken and my ding dongs to the side. I can admit that, uh, but that had been very recent. And so I thought, okay, so they wanted us to do one thing. And the only thing I could think of doing around physical was to actually respond to a referral slip that I had received uh, several months, almost a year prior uh, from my doctor. He told me to get a colonoscopy and he wanted me to have it right as I was turning 50. And I never responded to that. I took that referral slip, I put it on my nightstand and I can admit, I never had uh, any intention of responding to it. Uh, but when, we, when I had to commit to one thing, uh, they asked us to get an accountability buddy. And so my accountability buddy uh, my uh, my buddy out of New Jersey, he would call me with that New Jersey accent every morning. And he'd say, hey, you get that thing done? Did you get that thing done? And so for months, I kept saying, no, stop calling me. I, I don't know if I'm going to get it done. Finally, the day before my 51st birthday. So technically, I guess I was in compliance. Uh, I got a colonoscopy uh, pretty much a year after, a little over a year after my doctor told me uh, to get it. And so uh, what uh, the result was, uh, colon cancer. I had stage three colon cancer. He said it was one uh, lymph node from uh, stage four. Uh, so uh, three weeks after that, uh, I ended up um, uh, starting a chemotherapy therapy that was act actually brutal. Uh, my doctor asked me several times uh, if I had any signs. I continued to say no. Uh, and then as we started through the process, I had to uh, kind of admitted, and so I'll, I will admit it uh, to you uh, that I did have signs that I ignored. I had signs that I had ignored for about uh, two years. Uh, I actually had swollen lymph, lymph nodes uh, that I thought was a recurring sinus infection, but it was actually cancer. Uh, I attributed my weight loss uh, to a busy schedule and not taking time to eat three meals a day. Uh, the blood in my school, stool, yes, doctors, I did have uh, rectal bleeding. Uh, that I ignored and just thought it was a hemorrhoid or something. I didn't know what it was, but I just jotted it down uh, and didn't really look into it. Uh, when I told my husband for about six months that I just didn't feel like myself, uh, I thought I just needed a vacation. Uh, the back pain uh, that had me laid out at a Macy's cash register uh, on uh, Black Friday, uh, I thought was just a mild case of diverticulitis or something that I was starting to get because I was in my 50s. Um, I didn't think about the fact that my father died from colon cancer in 2009. I just thought that was his lifestyle and just something that would only happen to him. I never even thought about the fact uh, that um, that could actually uh, impact me. 
So I missed a lot of things. And fortunately, a colonoscopy saved my life. I mean, I can say it without a shadow of a doubt. A colonoscopy literally saved my life. Uh, who knows if it would have um, prevented me from going through what I had to go through with cancer? Probably, yes. I wish I had, had gotten it uh, two or three years uh, earlier, uh, but I'm glad I didn't get it a year later. I'm glad I finally got it uh, when I got it. So my message tonight is don't ignore the signs, know your family history, and when your doctor or your body says get a colonoscopy, do it. Uh, it was, and I've had, of course, now several colonoscopies because of the follow-up and all that. And fortunately, uh, no polyps have been found. Uh, all of I have five brothers and sisters. Uh, after, of course, I got colon cancer, uh, they all went to get colonoscopies. They all had polyps and they all had polyps that were removed. And I told them they can thank me. I took one for the team, uh, but fortunately uh, we are all uh, still alive. Uh, so it definitely could have been prevented. I don't mind talking about it uh, because if it can just save one life, uh, I'm willing to talk about it. Uh, get a colonoscopy and the, the sleep. I have my best friend just had one yesterday and we were talking about that's just the best sleep in the world. <laughs> when you come out of it and I'm just laying out and I just try to milk it too. I just tell my husband and kids, take care of me. Uh, so um, when, I, when it's time for me to go and get my next one, which I guess will be in probably about five years, I will go and, and get my next one. So uh, that is my story. A colonoscopy literally saved my life. And I am so glad we are having this session tonight. So back to you. Who am I turning it back over to? Because I could tell my story forever. I could tell you the good, the bad, and the... We're going right to Dr. Cosme. And thank you so much, Sint. Uh, well, thank you very much, Sint. Uh, this is a remarkable, you know, story that you shared, uh, and you know, uh, it has been very inspiring. It's a very hard, tough job for me to follow that presentation. Um, and uh, you know, thank you for you know, asking us and you know, reminding us about doing this colonoscopy. Quite inspirational. Um, you know, I actually had a poll question as well, um, uh, Miss Lang. Would you help me and see if we can ask the audience about the poll question? So it's almost uh, you know, looks like six, you know, two third people know someone or have personally suffered from colon cancer, uh, and then one third people who have not. So for those one third people, it's very important to make sure that you know we look for cancer screening and colon rectal cancer screening. So uh, the way I have organized, let me bring up my slides first. Um, So I wanted to share with you, you know, latest research that is going on uh, both at UT Southwestern, uh, but also at a national level and international level in regards to prevention and treatment uh, in colorectal cancer. Um, I have, uh, you know, picked up uh, three main topics and very briefly, I'm going to go over them. You know, first is um, there's an uh, increase of colorectal cancer incidence uh, among younger populations. Now I'm going to ask you to pay attention to these, you know, figures. Um, you know, you can see that on this figure where my uh, cursor is moving, um, on the x-axis you see the number of years, and on the y-axis you see, you know, the number of uh, people per hundred thousand that are affected with cancer. The lower graph is looking at people above 50 years old, and the top one is looking at, you know, people between 20 to 49. And you can see that both men and women, um, starting, you know, maybe early 1990s, we see that the incidence, meaning new diagnoses of colorectal cancer is decreasing both in men and in women. 
which is very much remarkable, you know, quite remarkable. And the reason is because around that time, the colon cancer screening became slowly and gradually became, you know, widely accepted and used. And we can see almost, you know, decreased by half in men and probably around 35 to 40% in women over the next two decades, which is the, you know, successful story about catching the cancer at a poly pre-cancerous lesion at a polyp stage and then preventing it from forming a cancer. So above age 50, the screening guidelines were there, but between age 20 to 49, we can see that in the similar years, since you know, 1975 to 76 down, there was initially a decline in the new cases, and then all of a sudden, overall slow rise in the number of new young onset colorectal cancer, both men and women. If you just look at numbers of people, so if you pay attention to the y-axis, obviously the cancer incidence is still higher in older people above age, you know, um, above age 50. But if you just look at the trend and the percentage change that is being noticed in younger population, um, it is alarming. And it's not just this, it's the prediction that we can do for young onset colorectal cancer uh, in the future. So we can see that by year 2020 and year 2030, there's supposed to be 90% anticipated increase in the uh, early onset colorectal cancer between age 20 to 34, around 27% between age 35 to 49, and then actually decline in uh, uh, colon cancer incidence above age 50 to 75 and above age 75 just because of prevention. So prevention works. That should be our biggest take home message from you know, um, the presentations today. In young onset colorectal cancer, there's also delays in their diagnosis because you can see here that the median symptom duration and medium workup duration for people less than 50 years old, non-advanced stage, meaning stage one, two, and three, was almost 120 days, six months before their symptoms started when eventually they got diagnosed. And during that time, the cancer can convert into an advanced stage. Similarly, almost 90 days, if they were presenting at advanced stage and compare that to the people who are above age 50, it was, you know, again, still not ideal, but better than that. So almost, you know, so this uh, more education to primary care and then being aware of the symptoms, education to patients so that, you know, they bring those symptoms early to their physician attention uh, is extremely important. Um, uh, Dr. Brewington had talked about the risk factors um, and then, you know, similar risk factors are also present in early onset colorectal cancer as well, but more so family history and hereditary colorectal cancer syndromes are probably the biggest reason why we see this rise. Other diseases, inflammatory bowel disease and tobacco use are also, you know, known risk factors that can lead to early onset colorectal cancer. Some lesser known risk factors, uh, you know, there's a dis you know, disparities between uh, African American and white race in regards to uh, incidence of uh, colorectal cancer in general, and also in um, you know early onset CRC. Similarly, previous history of radiation, uh, growth uh, hormone excess, people who have had organ transplant, but those are you know things that probably cannot be reversed. But there are other you know things that can other risk factors that can be um, you know identified and reversed. So for example, our Western diet, which is, you know, mostly consists of processed meat, red meat, has been associated with, um, you know, from 16% to 20% increased risk of development of colorectal cancer as compared to general population. Uh, similarly, obesity, uh, adolescent obesity, you know, is, in, is associated with two times increased risk of development of colorectal cancer. So almost, uh, you know, 100% increase as from baseline. Sedentary, you know, lifestyle. So people who spend a lot of time, at least two hours per day or 14 hours per week, sitting and watching TV and just not moving, that is almost double the risk of, uh, or 70% increased risk of colorectal cancer as compared to people who have, who watch less than seven hours uh, of television. Similarly, uh, the microbiome, which is the bacteria that grow within our uh, colon, have been associated with uh, young onset colorectal cancer. More diverse the um, microbiome, the less the you know it's, it, that protects against development of colorectal cancer. And how do we achieve that? Usually, we achieve that by making sure that our food, what that we eat, you know, consists of more diverse uh, um, uh, nut nutrients. Similarly, excessive alcohol intake 
has been associated with young onset colorectal cancer. What are the missed opportunities in colorectal cancer screening? So this, I think, is a very important you know, uh, graph, not just for you know, people, but also for physicians as well to understand. You can see that there, uh, this is colon cancer and rectal cancer. These are the birth cohorts from 1890 to 1990. Um, and from, you know, basically in people above age 55 to 59 in both colon and rectum, we see a decline in colorectal cancer incidence. This is because of screening for colorectal cancer. The current guidelines, you know, up until very recently used to state that we should do colonoscopy uh, in, in an average risk person, meaning no family history, no personal history of polyps, no other risk factors, they should have you know, screening done above age 50. Now it has been changed to age 45, but we can see that age 50 to 54, both in colon and rectal cancer, we were not achieving that you know, decline that we were hoping for, or if, if everybody was getting screened. So which there's a missed opportunity a lot of people between the age of 50 and 54 are not getting screened. So I think if our focus in addition to on the young population should also be including this group, because then we can save so many lives. If you look at the, how the COVID-19 uh, pandemic affected you know, uh, colorectal cancer screening, for this specific two to three years, we will see long-term outcomes later on. We don't know how it's gonna affect. Slowly and gradually, we are catching up to the uh, screening rate, but we're still not there yet. So the COVID-19 pandemic affected uh, our, uh, you know, so it was missed opportunity for colorectal cancer screening. Um, and similarly, we are missing a lot of patients who are age 50 to 54, where there's already for the last 10 years, recommendation for colonoscopy, we are not capturing those patients. So just, you know, a brief idea about well, how do we treat colorectal cancer? Um, and this is just one slide about that. So. For stage one patients, surgery uh, alone is, uh, has the highest chance of achieving cure. For stage two patients, surgery achieves a significant chance of achieving a cure with chemotherapy helping a small group of patients with stage two disease in achieving or increasing the chances of cure. For stage three patients, surgery being the main treatment, but then after that, three or six months of chemotherapy, depending upon the risk factor, mainly either Falfox or cape cytobine oxaliplatinum-based treatment can, all, can you know, reduce the uh, risk of cancer coming back. So for a stage three person, surgery and chemotherapy is the standard treatment. And for stage four treatment, usually we start off with chemotherapy, targeted therapies, immunotherapy in MSI high or microsatellite unstable colorectal cancers, and then try to identify patients who may have you know, localized disease and go after that localized disease through surgeries, through um, you know, specific radiation therapies, um, specific you know, uh, ablation-based therapies. And these are all as part of a multidisciplinary team discussions. You know, UT Southwestern, we have that on a daily basis. Um, the second you know, aspect of uh, latest research that is ongoing in colorectal cancer is uh, utilizing uh, and learning about use of circulating tumor DNA and its application in colorectal cancer. So tumor cells can release their DNA in the, in the bloodstream that recent technology has been able to pick up. And now we are trying to see in, in different stages of colorectal cancer to see how we can best utilize this. For, for example, stage two and three patients, we are, you know, at UT Southwestern, we are participating in a clinical trial uh, where uh, we are collecting serial bloods over two years time period, uh, trying to assess if we can pick up a circulating tumor DNA marker as a marker of you know, residual disease after the curative surgery. And can that help inform us in picking up relapse of cancer at an earlier stage? earlier than when it shows up in the imaging study. Similarly, the same technology can also be used to identify how uh, stage four patients develop resistance when they are on targeted therapy. Similarly, suppose if there's not enough tissue available, for example, a person had a biopsy, but not enough tissue to be able to learn more about the cancer through comprehensive analysis, these circulating tumor tests can be done 
to identify what type of mutations are present in the tumor uh, and can help us determine treatment or paradigm. There are two types. There are tumor-informed platforms, and then there are tumor-agnostic platforms, and both have utilities in different situations. Now, this is uh, one of the studies that was uh, published a few years ago, almost five years ago, where stage two and stage three, this is actually stage two patients who had uh, you know, a blood drawn after their surgery. And if circulating tumor DNA was identified in their blood after surgery, now out of, I think, 160 patients or 178 patients, it was a small number of people who had you know, uh, circulating tumor DNA positive, but out of those almost you know, 11 patients had disease recurrence, and by three years, most of them had cancer comeback. As compared to ctDNA negative, there were 90% people who were still free of disease. So the question comes, eventually, can we use such knowledge? You know, this study was done in a small group of people, 170. Now people are doing, you know, nationwide, you know, bigger cohorts to sort of confirm this trend, but then also trying to identify, you know, how can we patients who are ctDNA positive, is there a role for escalation of some standard treatment? You know, give them more therapy, identify more treatment for them so that they also become ctDNA negative. And, you know, on the opposite end, if they're circulating tumor DNA negative, can we decrease the intensity of treatment so that preventing long-term side effects? So that's where the field is going in regards to thinking about ctDNA. And most of these trials uh, will be open at uh, UT Southwest. Now, um, so that was the second aspect. The third aspect is, uh, you know, which is a big development in colorectal cancer is immunotherapy in a specific group of patients that uh, carry, uh, you know, that uh, are classified as microsatellite unstable. So what are microsatellite unstable cancers? So for a cancer to form, a mutation has to occur. In our normal cells, when the mutation occurs, our you know, the defense mechanism, the mismatch repair, you know, protein machinery corrects that defect. If a person is deficient in that mismatch repair protein machinery, their cancers, they, they, their normal cells tend to get many mutations, eventually turning that normal cell into a cancer cell. But that excessive mutation within the cancer cell can also be its Achilles heel, can also be you know, uh, something that we can target in our favor. So immunotherapy plays a role because immune system is trying to attack those highly mutated cells, but the tumor develops a resistance against them by suppressing the immune cells around it. And you know, immunotherapy breaks that, uh, um, that you know, suppression. And then now after the immunotherapy is present, the T cells become activated and those T cells can go and attack the cancer cell. So, in so this group of patients, microsatellite unstable high colorectal cancer immunotherapy has become a standard of care. Now, this group constitutes for a stage four patient, it's only like less than 5%. So 95% are microsatellite stable colorectal cancers, but only small group of people have this MSI high or microsatellite um, uh, instability in their tumor. Uh, so it's very important to test for that. And why? Because there was a big study that was you know, recently finished and published, a uh, multinational study where they compared to see people who have stage four disease, if they get chemotherapy upfront versus if they get immunotherapy, what happens? So the, on the x-axis, you see the number of months, and on the y-axis, you see the people who are surviving. You see that, you know, 24, 28 months, almost two, three, four years, there's a group of people with microsatellite instability who were started on immunotherapy are still living. Their cancer has not progressed, and they, are, they're, they're, they might still have cancer cells present in them, but it's not spreading to other places. So are, it becomes a chronic disease for that group. And actually, people who respond to it, they found that their this response could be more prolonged, um, and meaning that the immune system was able to develop memory against those cancer cells. And if any new similar cancer cell hiding somewhere grows back, it tries to attack it. Or maybe it completely eradicated that by that time. So 
this is a game changer for that specific you know, group of colorectal cancer patients. And you know, we have clinical trials for in the same, now the clinical trials are looking at, can we combine chemo and immunotherapy and eventually save more people? And that trial we are participating in UT South a national trial. So, you know, uh, patients who are newly diagnosed and has MSI high, they will be eligible for that. Similarly, now people are studying if MSI high tumors in stage two and stage three cancer, mainly stage three cancers, can where chemotherapy has a role to play. Can we add immunotherapy to that chemotherapy to again save more people? And that trial is also open at UT Southwestern. Now that was the last slide. So, you know, thank you very much for the organizers to, you know, give me that opportunity to share all that information. And I'll, you know, pass the baton back to you guys. Cecilia, Ali, and Sint, thank you so much. We really appreciate your uh, participation, your collective insight this evening. Let us start the Q&A part of our program. And we'll first start with some questions that are guest submitted ahead of time. And then we'll address uh, some of the audience questions as we have time. Now for the pre-submitted questions. Our first one is a question for Dr. Brewington from a concerned wife about the hereditary aspects of the disease. This wife's mother-in-law ha had colon cancer. What can an adult child of someone who's had colon cancer, in this case, a 50-year-old son, do better do to better his odds of not developing colon cancer or if he develops colon cancer, surviving this disease? So a child, uh, meaning a first degree relative of someone who's had colon cancer, we want you to screen earlier. So that's the first thing. So if you have a first degree relative who has colorectal cancer, you should screen 10 years before the age of diagnosis of that relative. So that's the first thing, screen early. Um, the second thing, of course, is to, to uh, observe those other things that can decrease your risk factors, such as don't overdo alcohol consumption, eat diets higher in fiber, exercise, um, and then be aware again of those symptoms that can be an early sign to detect a finding that might suggest uh, a, a cancer is present. So the change in bowel habits, um, observing for, for stool with blood in it, um, doing those types of things, weight loss that we weren't intending to do. Um, and so those are the things a child of uh, a parent who had a colorectal cancer can do. And then of course, share it with other family members, especially those first degree relatives to protect everyone else. Excellent. Um, and now this is a question for Sint or, or Dr. Cosme or both. Um, can you talk more about the swollen lymph nodes? I can, uh, I, I'm happy to talk about it. I had swollen lymph nodes uh, kind of in my neck area and on uh, the side of my head, the left side of my head. And that was going on, I, I'm ashamed to almost say for almost two years, uh, I had started having recurring sinus infections when we moved from California to North Carolina. And so I just thought it was all the pollen. And I guess for a while it was, uh, but I never really, thought that something else was going on in my body and something foreign was happening until of course I was diagnosed with cancer. And the doctor asked me, you know, have you had any signs? And then he started going through all the signs and uh, swollen lymph nodes was one of them. And I just kind of attributed it to something else. And that was just what happened to me. I'm not sure if that happens to everybody. The doctor would have to speak to that. Thank you very much. Um, so lymph nodes are normal organs that help us fight infection inflammation. You know, for example, like if a person has sinus infection, sore throat, you would expect these lymph nodes in the neck swell up and then shrink back down. That's the normal function of lymph nodes. And these lymph nodes are present throughout our body, like a chain. Cancer cells, especially like in most solid organ cancers, can sometimes use those lymph nodes to find new areas for them to grow so that they can spread through those lymph nodes uh, and involve other organs. When the surgeons do surgery, they not only take the colon, but also go deep down to the base of the you know, abdominal cavity and remove these lymph nodes out as well, because cancer cells can travel through those lymph nodes. Now, the lymph node in the neck may probably not be related to the lymph node in the abdomen, 
they remove the lymph nodes in the abdomen. And then a pathologist looks under the microscope to see if the number of lymph nodes are adequate. And then also if they are involved by cancer or not, because that determines the stage of cancer and it helps a medical oncologist decide about if a person needs chemotherapy or not after surgery. I hope that answers that question. Um, this mess, this uh, question is from Nancy for Dr. Brewington. My father had colon cancer in his early 70s. I'm 78 and I've had colonoscopies every three to five years. I hear that people over 80 no longer need colonoscopies if they don't have any polyps. Other doctors say otherwise. What would you advise? So I would advise that if you are a healthy individual that expects to continue living um, a, a very long and healthy life, then uh, that decision, um, if it were me, uh, I would continue screening. Um, so every decision that we make is based off of, an, of the individual situation. And that's the decision your doctor is going to make too. So they tend to take into account how healthy are you? Are you living a, uh, a very vibrant life currently? And if you are, there's no reason to think that you're, you're going to stop doing that. And so if you're going to live a longer time, then, then we expect you to continue to need to scream. So hopefully that answers that question. Excellent. Um, this message is for Dr. Cosme. Um, it's a two-part question. Um, Lisa had uh, noted that, that her children and her husband have APC gene. Um, so can you explain what the APC gene is and what has the research shown about gene cancer risk for those with this gene? How common is it? So a two-part question. Uh, first is, you know, what is an APC gene? So, um, you know, APC is a protein that is involved in cellular function, you know, without going into too much detail. And when the APC gene is mutated, you know, it's a, we call it a tumor suppressor gene, some pathways within the cell become active. And if the APC mutation gene is you know, running in the family, then it's a hereditary condition that can increase the risk of colon cancer formation. Now, cancers that do not run in family also have APC mutation because it's a very important mutation in colorectal cancer, like 70% colorectal cancer have that. But if you inherit it from your parents, then the cancer can occur, potentially occur, at a much younger age. Because you know, we get two copies, one copy from father, one copy from our you know, mother. And then if one of the, that copy is already abnormal, it's easier to get the second copy abnormal and then the risk of colon cancer increases. Um, people um, with the APC mutation running in the family, we call the word FAP, familial adenomatosis polyposis. They have a lot of polyps in their colon. Um, and you know, a lot of time they need to undergo preventative surgery. So when I use the word, so these patients are not average risk. For these patients, people who carry the mutation gene in the family, they need, probably need to start screening um, by age 18 if they are, you know, reach their adulthood, or even younger, at least 10 years younger than their youngest family member uh, that developed cancer. So sometime even in their teenager years, they need to start colon cancer screening. This is a very high risk, you know, inherited group of, you know, patients that need to undergo cancer screening early. Whatever we talked about, age 45, age 50, that's average risk for people who do not have any of these high risk. But FAP syndrome, APC mutation running in the family need to be screened at a much younger age. Excellent. Um, there is another question from Lisa. What are your thoughts on Cologuard for screening? Seems risky to test this way. And I'm going to take this, uh, this question. Mm -hmm. um, so Dr. Brewington had mentioned that basically the best test is any test that you're willing to have. And so if Cologuard is a test for you that you want to do a stool test at home and that's what you feel comfortable with, then I would say that that is a good option. Um, if it's positive, and it could be positive for two different reasons, could be positive because there's a little bit of detectable blood in your stool, 
could be positive because there is some abnormal DNA that's being detected. And so if either of those things happen, you need a full colonoscopy. So since I'm a gastroenterologist, I will always say that, that colonoscopy, from my point of view, is the best option. But it is, again, whatever you're willing to have. All right. And if I could add to that, Dr. Lowe, so again, so I say the best test is the one that you will do, but if you are um, up to the task of doing the test that's going to prevent cancer, the direct visualization tests have a better chance of detecting a polyp. So we talked about those. Those are the precursors. So before you develop a cancer, they're a small polyp. So if you take the, if you do the optical colonoscopy that my colleague, Dr. Lowe offers, or the CT colonography, then we're gonna find the polyps, the precursors. And so I advocate that you do a direct visualization test. But if you are what we like to call the busy bees um, who just don't get it done, who are going to put it off and you're gonna have a thousand things going on that, that cause you not to get screened, then do what you will do. And if that's a stool-based test, then do that because your chances are still going to be far better than if you did not screen at all. Excellent answer. Um, so uh, another question, what makes a cancer a slow growing cancer? No, that's a very, I don't know. The, I'm, I hope I understand the question correctly. Let me rephrase it. Maybe, what we might be asking is that why does the cancer grow over you know many years the way we described maybe as a polyp stage and then slowly slowly you know acquire more mutation and convert into a cancer and please correct me if that you know if i'm not asking this you know uh, understanding this question appropriately so polyp is a precancerous stage and some more mutations accumulate over time slowly and gradually that give an advantage to a clone of cell within that precancerous growth. And eventually some of those set of mutations combine together to form, lead to a cancer. Now, for so many mutations to occur in time, you know, it, it still takes time. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't happen, you know, automatically. So there's a lot of chance involved in that. Uh, so that's why it may take a, can a precancerous polyp to convert into a cancer over many, many, many years, potentially sometime 10 years, but it could also be, you know, some polyps can grow from, uh, you know, a polyp to a cancer within two, three years. So it's um, the standard one, the common ones may take many years, but some of them can be more quicker as well. Excellent. Um, is there a difference in the prognosis between right and left-sided colon cancers? Yeah. That's a very good question. Very well-informed audience. I'm, I'm actually very <laughs> pleased. <laughs> so, uh, so the question is, is right and left-sided colon different? So embryologically, they are different. They're derived from you know, different areas of gut. So the right side colon cancer, ascending colon, part of the transverse colon is derived from the mid gut at an embryological level and the descending colon sigmoid rectum is derived from the hind gut embryologically. Now, we have seen that the right-sided colon cancers that start from the ascending colon cecum transverse colon versus the left-sided, they have different behavior, meaning the right-sided colon cancer potentially, again, not applicable to everybody, potentially can behave a little more aggressively than the left-sided you know, tumors. And that actually is a reflection of an underlying biology of how the cancer develops. Meaning it doesn't matter right or left, it just means that maybe the type of mutations that occur together to form cancer on the right side, they potentially make it more aggressive as compared to the type of mutations that combine together to form the left sided tumor. Clinically, when we are deciding about treatment for a person, recent data within the last five years have shown that the choice of targeted therapies that we 
decide to combine with chemotherapy can be influenced by where the cancer started from. So it's a conversation that you have with your doctor uh, about you know, the choice of targeted therapies that can be added to the chemotherapy backbone. But that conversation is, you know, when, when as a physician we are thinking about it, is dependent upon where did cancer originate from? Did it originate from the left side or the right side? So there are biological difference, embryological differences, and that can eventually lead to some clinical decision-making differences in a person's care. Um, so this is a question for Sint. Sint, how does being a cancer, uh, a cancer survivor impact your life to this day? Oh, I had to, I, I got real serious about uh, my diet and what I eat and uh, to make sure that I stay healthy. And um, I called it, I, I have a new DNA. I, it's about my diet. It's about uh, uh, really, I, I just really focus on nutrition and I focus on activity. Uh, so I, I was always one that was active and I exercise, but I exercise now. Uh, more than ever. I try to make sure that I just don't deviate. I know I have to really focus on uh, my physical health. And so it, it obviously it's made me thankful and just more passionate about life uh, that I am alive considering the prognosis that I was given. Uh, but I'm really focused on uh, my health. Um, a final question for Dr. Brewington. There are some new non-invasive screening options in the market, including uh, a stool test. There's also a new one from Korea that apparently is 90% effective. What would the doctors advise if these options, if, they, if these options are useful instead of the traditional screening test, which I assume is colonoscopy or virtual CT? So I'm not familiar with the, the one that's being referred to uh, from Korea, perhaps uh, one of the other physicians on the call uh, is more familiar, but what I can tell you is this, we follow the science, right? That's why we are an academic medical center. So we look at the papers, we look at the research, we, we, we dissect the research, if you will, to see if it's good research. And that's what sets an academic medical center apart from uh, the everyday site that you, you go to for healthcare. That's our job. Our job is to study the science and to know whether it's valid or not. And so if there's a new test on the market, our doctors at UT Southwestern are going to look at that data and see if that evidence is strong enough to say that it could replace what we currently know works, the test that we have out there today in the market. Excellent. All right, so thank you again to my colleagues, Dr. Brewington, Dr. Cosme, and to the great Scent Marshall for a robust conversation about prevention, the importance of screening, and the various treatment options that are emerging. And thanks to you, our guests, for joining us tonight and asking such great questions. Again, please call UT Southwestern's patient navigators at 214-645-8355 to make your screening colonoscopy appointment, and you'll see it in the chat as well. Whether you come to see us at UT Southwestern or go through your own physician's group, please, please get screened. Finally, thanks to Public Affairs for helping facilitate tonight's event and a huge special thank you to Ms., uh, Mrs. Marshall and the Dallas Mavericks for collaborating with us during March, which is Colon, Aware Colon Cancer Awareness Month and being part of tonight's Science Cafe. Join the Science Cafe team again in two weeks on Thursday, March 24th for the next program focused on liver transplantation and then on Thursday, March 31st for our program on autism. On behalf of our Colon Cancer Science Cafe team, as we close out this evening, we wish you all good health and wellness and a good night. Thanks again for joining us and we are adjourned. <laughs>